Hey everyone, I am Steve from GamersNexus.net and today we're talking about chipset differences looking at the new Intel lineup. So that would be the 100 series chipsets and we're primarily looking at Z170, H170, and H110. There are three other main chipsets that are out and that would be Q170, Q150, and B150. These are all classified as business chipsets but as seen here by this MSI B150 motherboard, they can be outfitted for gaming. So it is a possibility. We're not gonna talk about those as much in this video, but they have been discussed in the article linked in the description below if you wanna read more about the business series chipsets. And then we've got things like the Z170 EVGA board over here. So two representations of what the motherboard market looks like in the immediate future. And before we dive into the individual differences of each chipset out there, we need to talk about what a chipset is and establish sort of a base knowledge pool of how it all works. So a chipset can effectively be thought of as the brainstem of your computer. This is something we've written about in the past, a couple of years ago actually. And the chipset handles all of the I.O., all of the transfer and exchange of information in your computer. Your PCIe devices can communicate through the chipset and will. The storage devices can go through the chipset, USB, gigabit ethernet, all of that stuff at some point can feed through the chipset in order to access and communicate with other devices that need to be met in the chain of command. So the CPU, of course, can sort of overseeing everything. The CPU has its own lanes and integrations now with modern devices as well. So modern CPUs have their own PCIe lanes on the die itself. That means the CPU can and does allocate some of its own PCIe lanes to your attached devices like video cards. So the chipset doesn't do as much as it used to when the days of Northbridge and Southbridge still existed, but it is an important part in that you can't have a computer without one. So that's the baseline. The next thing is to establish what Intel's branding means. So these chipsets use two different prefixes and there are many other chipsets out there as well. The ones we're talking about and the only ones that exist really in the consumer market and business market are X chipsets, Z, there used to be P, H, Q, and B. And we're gonna talk about what each of those means very briefly. X is the Extreme Series chipset. This is the one associated with the LG A2011 socket type, which means that there are 2011 contacts on the CPU, 2011 pins on the motherboard, more or less. You can activate some pins or deactivate them as needed by the motherboard manufacturer. But that's the X series, and then there's the Z series, which is performance. Z used to be called the P series. You may remember things like the P50X, whatever it was, P57 maybe, uh, motherboards, and that was superseded by the Z series. It means performance. That is going to be sort of the mainstay for gaming enthusiasts, for people who are interested in overclocking and things like that. The H series is more mainstream. So it's still an important chipset, but it disables some things like overclocking, which generally makes it more affordable than its Z series counterpart. The B and Q series are both business class chipsets, and as such, they enable some features that are totally uninteresting to a lot of gamers out there, but very useful for business applications. As an example, one of those would be protection against lower level attacks on the system where an attacker, a hacker, might be attempting to gain access or inject something at a low level before the operating system is loaded. So there are protections against that in some of the business class chipsets. And then things like B150, which is what this board is right here. Clearly, you can outfit B150 to be a gaming motherboard, as MSI has done, but it is still equipped with business class features. It has Intel Small Business Advantage and items like that. And you can check the full charts on that if the video is too quick for you in the article below. Let's get into the 100 series differences. For the 100 series, we have things like HSIO, high speed IO lanes, we have PCIe lanes, and all sorts of other items that go into the differentiation of chipsets. The main item for the 100 series is the inclusion of HSIO lanes. <clears throat> A high speed IO lane is allocatable by the motherboard manufacturer to some extent for different devices in the system. So this means that companies that make the motherboards actually have some control and customization over the board, which allows for further differentiation in the motherboard market. And that helps in a time when a lot of the controllers have been moved to the CPU itself, like 
the memory controller several years ago and things of that nature. HSIO lanes are consistent of the gigabit ethernet options, the SATA options, PCI Express, and other IO devices, M.2 would be included in there as it is a PCIe interface device. And with Z170, you get 26 of those lanes, the HSIO lanes. With the H170 board, you get 22, four fewer. With the H110, you get 14. So that's the difference at a top level. What that translates into is a difference of how many ports are available on the devices. Now, just because there are 26 HSIO lanes available doesn't mean that the motherboard manufacturer has to fill their board with PCIe or SATA or USB devices. This is a good example. This is a mini ITX motherboard. It's about six and a half by six and a half inches. It physically cannot fit any more than it's already on that board, more or less. So to that extent, just being Z170 doesn't mean you're gonna use all of those HSIO lanes for some crazy config. The next big difference is PCIe devices. With Z170, you get 20 PCIe lanes available on the chipset, but those are offered in chunks of four. So you can't take eight of them and give them to a video card, for example, it's, it's in chunks of four. So that's very important. With H170, there are 16 PCIe lanes on the chipset. With H110, there are six. And do keep in mind, as I said earlier, the CPU itself has some lanes as well, and those will generally be given to your video card. So these lanes can be used for things like M.2 devices. An M.2 SSD will generally want by 4 or X4. That means it wants about four lanes for peak efficiency, and that includes the new Samsung 950. And these are part of the HSIO system, so they're allocatable to different interfaces on the board as the manufacturer deems necessary. Other than this, it's generally gonna be for capture cards, things like that, so if you want more PCIe devices on your board, including more video cards, you should be going Z170. You kind of have to, actually, with video cards because the maximum PCIe configuration for video devices is one by 16 device on, this is Z170, one by 16 device, two by eight devices, or one by eight and two by four devices for a total of three. With H170, you get one by 16 or X16 device, and the same is true with H110. You get one X16 device, and that's generally gonna be your video card if you are any kind of gamer with a higher end card. So one thing to note here is that with SLI, it is actually required by NVIDIA to have a by eight minimum lane allocation to video cards in the in the SLI setup. So if you wanna do SLI, you're basically stuck with two cards right now, and that may change as manufacturers institute things like multiplexing and PEX chips, PLX chips, things like that. You will see things change a bit in terms of the specs offering on websites. The lane allocation will look different, but in reality, it's just being multiplexed. And then on H170, you're basically given one by 16 device, and you might get a couple other devices through the chipset, not through the CPU, where you are able to do things like uh, M.2 or whatever. Two more major differences here, and one of them is pretty critical, the memory support and the overclocking support. Z170 is the only of these chipsets that is capable of overclocking through UEFI BIOS. So if you buy a K-SKU CPU and you have intent to overclock that CPU, Z170 is the only board that is in consideration for Skylake processors right now. The other option here, or the other item of note, is the memory configuration. Z170 and H170 are the same. They have two DIMMs per channel, and they have two channels. H110, which is much more affordable, has one DIMM per channel and it has two channels. That means your capacity is going to be limited, your memory configuration is going to be limited. So do keep that in mind with the H110 chipset. In terms of overclocking and multi-GPU configurations and other devices and generally the question of which chipset is right for me, the way we determine this for our own builds is to start with a couple of simple questions. The first one, you need to ask yourself, am I interested in overclocking if the answer to that is no, you can still buy a Z-Series chipset for other reasons, but you don't need it for 
the overclocking function. It's just not going to serve you any good. So at that point, you can start looking at H170. The next question, am I interested in multiple GPUs? And am I interested in multiple PCIe devices, which means GPUs, PCIe SSDs, and M.2 SSDs in this specific case? If the answer to that is no, meaning you want a CPU, you don't necessarily care about overclocking, and you want a GPU, you don't necessarily care about having more of them, then H170 is pretty much where it's at. H110 is still an option, but we'll talk about that momentarily and where it becomes limited in some areas. So those are the main questions. Other things to ask yourself are about RAID. H110 does not support RAID, but Z170 to H170 do, and the Q and B chipsets have their own uh, RAID support as well, listed in the specs table. But for the mainstream chipsets, that's what we're looking at. And then other items, multi-monitor support using the IGP. For the IGP, multi-monitor support is limited to three monitors on Z and H170, and two monitors on H110. So that is another limitation that should be noted for those who are building more of an office-suited PC where you're not gonna have a video card. There was a user recently who commented on the article asking a pretty good question. They asked, is there a reason I would want a Z series chipset if I'm not overclocking and I am not doing multiple video cards? The answer is yes, but kind of. So the reasons for yes are a few. One of them is fairly specific. It's that you want high-end components that are associated with the Z series chipset, but you don't necessarily need the actual features provided by the chipset. So what I mean by this is higher quality capacitors, chokes, VRM, things like that. Now, if you're not overclocking, you're not using the features, you don't necessarily need those higher quality components. But this is a use case that I've heard from some people who have, 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 who have had me build systems for them, excuse me. And another reason for buying Z series without wanting to use multiple video cards or overclocking would simply be because you need more HSIO devices. So if you're doing some crazy internal NAS or capture card setup or anything where you're using a lot of IO or you want a lot of USB available or anything like that, then yes, Z170 is still on the table for consideration. For most users, if you're not overclocking, you're not doing multi-GPU, you're basically looking at H170 immediately, then H110 as an alternative. The reason I am not a massive fan of suggesting the H110 to at least US builders is because generally the price of the H110 motherboard is going to hit a ceiling. So this, this is true of the previous H series as well. So with the H series motherboards and the lower end chipsets, there is sort of a, an associative price where the motherboard eventually hits a ceiling and it, it stops increasing the quality of components even though the chipset doesn't necessarily dictate the quality of those components. And in the US market, you'll see H170 boards that are very good and comparable to some of the H110 boards in price, but you get the extra feature support of RAID and some expansion if you wanna grow or generally just potentially higher quality components. And if you're in Asia markets, if you're in non-US markets, H110 starts making a lot more sense for pricing reasons. I'm not super familiar with those, but that is one of the reasons that the ultra low end chipset exists. For users who are on a very tight and restrictive budget, H110 is where you wanna start looking for a cheap motherboard. If you're doing something like a low end, maybe Pentium setup, and you have no plans to overclock or do anything like that. So that's sort of the roundup of the existing Intel chipsets that came out with the Skylake processors, the architecture, and the 100 series. Q and B are definitely worth looking at. Hit the link in the description below for more information on those. But if you have any questions, if I've skipped over something, please leave a comment below. I'll try to help you out. Otherwise, hit our forums on the website, gamersnexus.net, and we'll help you there. That's all for this time. If you like this type of reporting, as always, check out the Patreon link in the post roll video. We've picked up a couple of backers now. Super excited about that because it helps us remain pretty independent and keep the journalistic approach to things that we do. So that's all for this time. I'll see you all next time.